A little over two years ago, Rob Lawless began a journey to meet 10,000 strangers, spending an hour with each of them. Partly inspired by Malcolm Gladwell's idea that spending 10,000 hours doing something makes you an expert, and partly inspired by curiosity, Rob set out on this journey knowing that it might take more than a decade. Leaving behind his career in finance and tech sales, Rob took a huge risk and made the bet that creating human connection is currently a more important foundation for his future than building his savings account. That's why I'm so excited about having Rob on the podcast today. Ever since he started this project, he's attracted a dedicated following and national interest, all because he decided to lean into the fact that it's about time society did something about battling the human epidemic of loneliness. Since the birth of his project, Rob's 10K Friends, he's attracted a massive following and national attention, meeting everyone from street artists to people experiencing homelessness, to CEOs, to former mayors and DJs and students and millionaires. After each meeting, he posts a photo on his Instagram and Facebook, along with a short story on what he's learned about each person. Rob is currently 17% of the way to 10,000, which is no small number. I'm Brandon Harvey, and this is Sounds Good, the weekly podcast where we have conversations with inspiring people who are rejecting cynicism and using their lives to make an impact. This conversation was a lot of fun for me. I think we can all learn from Rob's passion for human connection. So let's just jump straight into this conversation. Man, so you and I were talking before we started recording and I was trying to figure out how I first came across your Instagram, but I have no idea, really no clue. But I do know that I deeply resonate with it and I love following along with what you're doing in this amazing project you're working on. So I almost just want to start back at the beginning before we even dive into your project, you know, which is largely focused on getting to know people. And I want to just hear about your social life growing up. What was what was Rob like as a kid? Sure. So I've always been a people person in grade school. Like I remember being excited to go to high school because there would be more people to hang out with there. (laughs) And then in high school, the same thing. So I went to Penn State after high school, and the fact that there were 40,000 students there was one of the biggest draws for me. I think a lot of people are discouraged by that, but I loved the fact that I would see a new face every day, have the ability to make friends, but also just be in a place of freshness and newness. So yeah, I've always been a people person. It's funny because a lot of times people will ask me like, Were you shy as a kid? Is this project a way of you putting yourself out there? And it's really not. It's more of me just doubling down on what I've always enjoyed, which has been people. So yeah, always an outgoing kid. I think over the years, I've mellowed out a lot. So I'm the youngest of three siblings, the youngest boy of 16 cousins on my dad's side. And throughout all of our family parties and the holidays and stuff, I was always the kid seeking attention from the older cousins, from the aunts and uncles, always the entertainer, to the point where they'd be like, Rob, you need to calm down. You have to kind of take a break. And uh, yeah, I've mellowed out, out a lot over life, but I've never lost my, my love for meeting new people. That's amazing. What were your like, parents, or did, if you had siblings, like what, what were they like? Were they social and outgoing, or... Were you in some ways compensating for their lack of that socialness? Yeah, they were, they were social as well. It's interesting because my brother, he was always quiet growing up and a little more serious. And now he's turned into like the class clown of the family. He's always the one making jokes and he's much more outgoing than he was as a kid. My sister, she's always been outgoing as well and is still that way. So no, no overcompensating or anything like that, but... Yeah, I think, I mean, they've both been good examples of how to be social in my life, but I've always just taken it a step further. And even with clubs and activities in high school, I was involved in so many. And then when I got to Penn State, I was the same way. As soon as I got there, I knew that I had a few high school friends that would be going to the campus as well. But for me, it was like, there's so many more people here to meet that I just want to expand as much as I can. And so... At what point after college do you begin this new project? 
After college, so I graduated May of 2013. And what did you study? Finance. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so I studied finance. I minored in accounting and entrepreneurship. And my first job out of school, I was doing consulting for a company called Deloitte. So I was a business analyst um, traveling for work, mainly working in Excel sheets and PowerPoint presentations. And in January of 2014, so about eight months after I graduated, I came up with this idea to meet 10,000 people in one year. And I thought I would meet everyone for 10 minutes at a time. And it would be this awesome thing and people would hear about it. And I would just become an overnight success. And somehow that one year would allow me not to work in my 20s and 30s or whatever. And it's funny because it, it was such a naive idea at the time and it wasn't coming from a place of authenticity. So it kind of just sat in my iPhone notes where I first wrote it down. And then I left Deloitte after a year and three months to go to a tech startup based in Philly. So I'm from the suburbs of Philly. Uh, and for that company, I moved into the city in June of 2015. So moved into Philly June of 2015. And seeing Philly kind of as my campus like a new campus like Penn State was to me, I kind of revisited the project in September of 2015 because I was writing journal entries to myself just on the transition from Deloitte to the startup and kind of trying to figure out my life. And in my second journal entry, I had written, my ability to meet people is what will take me to where I want to be. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. I kind of just wrote it as a journal entry. But Reflecting back on it, it was kind of an aha moment for me to revisit the project and actually take steps towards it. So September of 2015, I started emailing random people in the Philly area. I would hit them up on Instagram and just say, hey, I have this idea. I want to spend one hour now with 10,000 different people just to see what comes with opening doors for no particular reason. Do you want to be one of the first 10 people? So... Luckily, one guy got back to me and he said, yeah, this sounds cool. Like, I'll meet you for lunch. So November of 2015, I met this guy, Jim Brady, in Philly for lunch. And we sat down and we're talking. We're like halfway through the conversation. And he says, so what number am I? Like 1,000 or 2,000? And I was like, no, dude, you're number one. Like, you are the start of the project. Wow. So he was the start. And uh, from there, so... Met him November 2015. I met four people that December, four people that January, five people that February. And then it just kind of went and went from there. So I'll just kind of stop there and, and yeah. see if you have any questions because I could keep going. No, I love that, man. That's so interesting. Where did that number 10,000 come from in the first place? Because it sounds like that was there from even the earliest iteration. Right. I think at the time it was just, if I think back to when I wanted to do it in one year, it was just a number that I thought would turn heads. Like 10,000 people is just so many people. And I think I figured with meeting that many people, somewhere along the way, the project had to, it had to work because someone would have an idea of how to monetize it or just how to continue it. But then when I added the hour at a time portion into it, it sort of became someone of the 10,000 hours theory, which I had first read. Yeah, from Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, and his Outliers book. So at that point, and I say all the time, I'm not aiming to become an expert in anything, but it, I was just uh, admiring the idea of someone committing to something for that long, like that long of a period of time. Um, and then very trivial, like a very trivial reason, I think I Googled, how many people does the average person meet in their lifetime? And there was one dude who had one commencement speech on YouTube, and he said the average person meets 10,000 people in their lifetime. And I don't even know if that's true or not, but I just thought to myself, I wonder what that looks like when you compress meeting all of those people to age 35 or age 40. How does that serve the rest of your life? Like If you've met 10,000 people by age 40, what are those relationships look like as you go into your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, etc. Wow. And so your goal would be to meet 10,000 people before what age? I think so. I'm 27 now. 
I started the project when I was 24. I think it'll take like 10 years from now to complete. And I'm very lax with that. I've always said if it takes eight years, that's cool. If it takes 15 years, that's cool as well. One of the things that I'm noticing is when I leave or travel to new locations, so I'm in Los Angeles now. I'm originally from Philly. The first thousand-ish people I all met in Philly. And when I came out to LA, there was kind of a break in momentum because no one out here really knew about the project. So it kind of felt like starting at square one. But knowing that, I think there will be breaks of momentum going forward because I'd love to spread the project to other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And I'd rather it take 15 years and span the globe than take eight years and do it all in Philly. So yeah, I don't know. I think um, if I had to take a bet, I'd bet that I'll be finished by the time that I'm 40. But it's just, it's not something that I, I feel the need to hold myself to. Man. So when you're, when you're sitting down with people and you're getting to know them for the first time, you're, you're actually meeting them. What does your conversation look like over the course of that hour? You know, what are you kind of going in with? What are other people going into that time with? What does that look like? Yeah, it's funny. Um, there is no right or wrong way for it to go. I always say my interest in people is I'm curious as to where they are now, where they were, and the in-between of how they got there. And then I also want to know where they want to go with their life. And I don't know why I want to know that. It's just, for me, it's like watching a movie and having them explain it to me. But there are people that I'll go in and I'll talk with, and it remains very surface level the whole time. There are people that I'll go in and talk with, and they'll tell me like the depths of their lives. So they're both the right answer to me. And even even then, for me, I think the goal is more just about sharing that hour of time together. So there have been people that I've gone surfing with. There have been people that I've played in softball games with. One girl emailed me over the summer. I didn't get the chance to sit down with her. But she asked me if I just wanted to share an hour of space with her and just sit in silence. And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. I think um, by sharing that time and space together, you're still creating a connection with one another. So for me, it doesn't always have to look like us talking and sharing our lives, but I am generally curious about people's backgrounds. So most of the time, it is kind of where they are, where they were in the in-between of how they got there. What does your kind of day-to-day schedule look like these days while you're kind of, you know, devoting your life to these interviews? Are you working right now or are you are you full on uh, having conversations with people? Sure. So I've been... I've been doing this full time since July of 2016. Wow. Which, yeah, that in itself has been an interesting journey, which we can talk more about. But um, my daily schedule, so I typically wake up at 6.45, go to the gym at 7. I'm back by like 8.15, shower and just hang out till 9. Then I'll make breakfast and I'll make my lunch. And then I hit, so I'm living in Long Beach right now. And most of the meetings or people that I'm meeting are in different parts of LA. So I usually have at least an hour commute to get to the first meeting. So every day I'm out the door by 10.45 a.m. to meet the first person at noon. I'll meet with them from noon to one. And then between one and 2 p.m., I'll write their story, post it to Instagram, and then travel to the next spot. And then I'll meet someone at two, post their story from three to four, meet someone at four, and then meet someone at 6, drive back home to Long Beach, usually get home between 8, 8.30, post their story between 8.30 and 9. Then I make dinner and I hang out with my roommate and usually in bed by 10 to go and do it the next day. And somewhere in that time, usually the mornings or at night, I'm messaging people to set up times for the next week. And when you're scheduling time with people, are you just... Are you just having like a normal back and forth? Be like, what time works for you? Like what day? Or or are you kind of automating the system at some point? I have Google Calendar and I have two different calendars. So one is a purple, it's just purple time slots at noon, two, four, and six. And they say open. And then I have green ones, which is where I'll send the calendar invites from my email to the person I'm meeting with. So if I were scheduling with you for next week, I'd say, okay, I'm typically available noon to 4 and 6 p.m. during the weekdays. Where are you located in L.A. and what time works best for you? So if you were to say, I'm in Santa Monica, I'm available Tuesday at 4 p.m., 
I'll probably look up like a coffee shop or a park or something in that area, ask you if that's cool. If 4 p.m. works, I'll send an invite. I'll delete the open slot and add you in as a green slot. And then I'll build the day around you. So I'll start to look for other people in Santa Monica. So if you said you were in Burbank, I'd build the day up in Burbank or somewhere near there. So there's a lot of logistics that go into it. It's interesting, though, because, you know, you could see it losing its its magic by having to do all the logistics. But I almost see it more so as that intentionality that you're creating around meeting people. That's like that's beautiful that you're spending so much time and energy, you know, ensuring that you have the opportunity to spend this time with another human. Um, you know, you're dedicating really more than an hour to them and certainly more than an hour of, of mental space. That's really, really cool. Yeah, and it's cool. And all of the the processes that I have in place now are just things that have naturally evolved over time, having done the project for about two and a half to three years at this point. Tell me a little bit about the digital aspect of this. So obviously, you're having these one-on-one conversations with people in real life, and that's an important, beautiful moment for you and that person, but it doesn't stop there. You're then turning around you know, with consent, sharing this story on Instagram, you know, what purpose does that serve for you? What's kind of the the value for that person? What's the value for you? And, and most of all, kind of how is your audience on Instagram responding to these stories? So it's interesting because I think that I see it a lot differently than someone who follows my project sees it or even the people that I meet with see it. So a lot of times my people will mistake me for interviewing people because I write about them. But for me, I've never seen what I do as interviews. I've seen it as two people coming together to equally get to know each other. And then I'm just sharing what I remember from our conversation on Instagram as a way for me and that person to document our time together. So for example, I met this girl Kayla last night and me posting her picture and her story for my purposes, is so that 10 years from now, when we forgot we ran into each other, that we can look back on that story and that picture and say, hey, look, we met here at Intelligentsia in Silver Lake. Remember that conversation we had? Look, here's what we talked about. That's cool. Yeah, so that's how I see it. Um, Instagram for me has always been more of a, a place of documentation than anything else, but I think it's interesting. So the people who meet with me, for them, it's definitely a chance to share their stories and what they're working on with the people who follow my account. Um, and I, I think they, they do think that I think that's exciting for them to see kind of what I take away from our time together. Because that's another thing, like when I meet with people, it's just straight up informal conversation. I'm not taking notes or anything like that. So everything that I write is written from memory. And then the people who follow along, it's cool to see them react to other people's stories, especially when they can relate to one. So whenever I put a story out about someone's life, whether it be like some tragedy that they had to go through or some triumph that they've reached, it's always neat to see other people comment and be like, hey, I'm going through that too, or hey, I've had a similar experience. And I think that's part of the beauty of opening ourselves up to other people is because we're allowing the world to see that we are similar in a lot of ways. What kind of stories do you think that people are connecting with the most? What do you see the most kind of traction on on a personal level? That's a good question. I think, I don't know. I, th- I think I don't have a, a, a good tab on that, but I think it could be anything. And that's kind of one of the things, like that's one of the things that I'm learning through this project is if you are interested in something or have experienced something, chances are that there's someone else out there who has an interest in that topic or has experienced that same uh, thing in life. So again, I think that's one of the the cool things because it's not so much that there are popular things, but that everything is relatable in a way. It's kind of cool to think about that, that there's not like a specific thing where it's like, oh, well, maybe if all of us had that part of our story, we could connect with more people. You know, you never know what's going to connect with somebody. And, you know, you're sharing on Instagram and you've got a set number of followers. And, you know, maybe sometimes you're sharing something and it's almost as if that that story that somebody you met with shared and you posted, 
was meant for somebody who was following you so they don't feel as alone or so that they feel, you know, more connected to somebody. But it could also be that, you know, that story is meant for somebody who's going to find that in five years. You know, they they might see it in 10 years. Like it's, it's wild to think about how, you know, even if you had a story that never got a single comment, you know, it could still have this like profound impact on somebody in some other way. I guess it's really cool that, that you don't see something specific that really pops every time. Yeah. Yeah. The timing thing is interesting. And it is cool that people have the ability to kind of scroll back and, and see other people, other people's stories. It's almost like a, a library in a way of just stories. I just wanted to take a quick break from this conversation to tell you about the sponsor of this week's episode of Sounds Good, Hover. Hover is the company that makes it easy to buy a domain name for your big idea. Hover also believes that the internet has the power to bring change in the world. Put those together and you have something powerful. When you have a passion or idea, a way to bring change in the world, the first and biggest step you should take towards bringing this idea to the internet is to buy a domain name. The great thing about Hover is that there are no upsells and the website is clean and easy to use. All you do is search, buy, and boom, you have a domain name. You're ready to share your idea with the world. This is what I've done for every single idea I've ever brought to life. When inspiration struck for the good newspaper, the first thing I did was see which domain names were available on hover.com and immediately picked up goodnewspaper.org. And I'm so glad that I did that. For listeners of Sounds Good, Hover is offering 10% off your first purchase when you visit hover.com slash sounds good. Go to hover.com slash sounds good today to save 10% on your domain name and to help support the podcast. Hover, making it easy to bring your passions and ideas to life for the sake of changing the world. And now, back to the rest of this conversation. As of today, how many conversations have you had? How many people have you met? I have met uh, 1,766 people. Wow. Dang, so that's what, 17% of the way to 10,000? Yes. Man, that's wild. Do you, 1,700 plus people in, do you feel like you still remember most of the people? Like if if somebody who you've had a conversation with before knocked on your door right now, would you recognize them? Would you remember their story? How much can you really hold inside your brain? Yeah, that's a good point. I think um, a lot of the people I do remember, and I'm sure there are some people that, I would forget. And I think I'm starting to get to that point where sometimes I'll scroll back through my Instagram and think to myself, wow, I forgot I met with that person. But there's a lot of people, especially when I'm in Philly, it's interesting. So I think spending an hour with one person is just laying the foundation for you to build upon that relationship in the future. And in Philly, one of the really cool things that occurs is I'll bump into people from my project all the time. That's cool. Yeah, even out here in LA. So the, some of the people that I've met, they become more memorable to me because I see them after the fact. And one of my favorite stories of bumping into someone is from about a month ago. I was driving from Long Beach to Santa Monica to meet with this photographer for my project. And as I'm driving, someone in the car next to me beeps at me. And I was changing a song on my on my phone, so I thought maybe I swerved into their lane and so I just refocused on the road and they beeped again. And I looked over and it was this girl, Erin, who I had donated blood with in Philly as part of my project back in October. Whoa, across the country. Yeah, which is crazy. And so I I tried to message her. She wasn't on Instagram anymore. So I kind of just went into the meeting, met with the photographer. When I came back to my car, I saw a notice on it. And I was like, ah, oh, crap, I got a, a ticket. And... I looked and I opened up the thing and it was a note from Aaron being like, hey, Rob, that was me beeping at you. I'm not on Instagram anymore, but I'm out here with my boyfriend who you also met. We'd love to catch up over dinner sometime. And Ah, that's amazing. Yeah, it was awesome. And I usually write the stories of the people I meet in my car. And as I was writing the story of the photographer, Aaron came walking up the road. So I saw her and I like jumped out of the car and gave her a hug. Um, and those, I think 
if you talk about success of my project, for me, that's probably one of the biggest pieces of it is being able to have those moments in life where I'm bumping into someone who I feel comfortable and familiar with at any location in the U.S. or around the world. I just want to create that for myself more often. That's really special. That's that's almost a part of your story that gives me goosebumps the most. This idea of you know, you laying the groundwork with 10,000 people so that you can have these more intimate, more special connections spontaneously and randomly down the road. That's really, really cool. Right. Yeah, it is awesome. I love it. And I've, I've since then bumped into Aaron again last week when I was finishing up a meeting with another guy. <laughs> I like that too, because then I introduced him to her and oh, she amazing. got to meet him. So yeah, it's really cool. And I think like I'm very much looking forward to more of those instances in the future. What do friendships look like for you in this time where you're meeting so many new people? How do you, you know, continue to go deep with a few close friends while you're still continuing to like make a lot of new connections? You know, it, it's kind of that old question of would you rather have a thousand acquaintances or one best friend? You know, how do you strike that balance? Because I, I would imagine that you're in, in many ways, you're kind of pursuing both. Yeah, it's interesting because I have a, a very, very solid group of friends from high school and college, and I love those friends dearly, and they've been very supportive uh, of me throughout this project. So I don't know. I think I still, I still dive into those friendships because the interesting thing is I'm meeting people when my friends are at work. So I still have my nights to hang out with my roommate. I still have my weekends to hang out with him. So I kind of prioritize. It's like them. They prioritize their weekends to hang out with friends or family rather than going back into the office. So for me, it's a bit of the same process. And I don't think that it's affected my friendships in any way. So I feel like I... I, And it's interesting too because I think I'm almost diving deeper into my appreciation of the friends that I've had before the project. really? Yeah, just because realizing like how much they've supported me and realizing how much connection matters in my life, it's made me be more conscious of the time that I have with them. And that goes for my family as well. I think one of the things that I've learned through my project is that life is finite because I've met people who have had siblings or parents or friends who've passed away. So I think it's hard to confront that when it doesn't occur in your own life, but because I've heard it so often, it's one of the things that I've accepted and I'm now conscious of when I do spend time with my friends and family. So for example, like when I'm home with my parents and I'm with my mom, like I'll hug her and kind of store that moment in my mind because I know that it's not going to last forever. So if I'm lucky, like I'll be on this earth longer than they are. So I want to make sure I'm conscious of those moments when I still have them. What have been some of the challenges along the way in pursuing this project? Not necessarily the logistical challenges, but the the personal and emotional challenges as you're as you're, you know, doing something that nobody else is doing. I think it's very much uh and like an intense mental journey. I think about if other people were to go down a similar path, there's a lot of mental strength involved because Essentially, for the past two years of my life, I've just watched my savings drop and drop and drop and have had to tell myself, you just got to keep going forward because eventually it will work out. It'll work out. And I think that's probably been one of the the hardest things. And I think anyone who's pursuing their own path, and I'm sure you can recognize this in your life, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it on your own, there are so many cycles of doubt and confidence along the way. And I think just weathering that storm has been one of the hardest parts. But I think the more that I've gone through the journey, the more I know how to do that. So in the beginning, when I doubt myself, I'd kind of be down on myself. But after knowing that I'd go back into a spike of confidence, now if I'm ever feeling doubtful, I know that the confidence is right around the corner. So yeah, I think just that that process has been tough. And it, it still occurs like, you, you caught me at an interesting time because, so I went to Coachella two weeks ago or whenever it was, 
had an awesome time with my brother and my friends. But when I'm with those people, like I'm completely away from my project. So wasn't messaging people or setting up times to meet. And I came back into the project and it, it really felt like it was taking a lot to get the momentum going again. I had cancellations all through that week, that Thursday that I came back. I had four meetings scheduled. I had three of them cancel at the last minute. So only met one person that day and kind of my progress is tied to how many people I'm able to meet per day. Um, so there was like this, this cycle of doubt at that point and it kind of seems like no one's paying attention to the project. It's not really getting looked at at all. And then yesterday I met with this kid, Matt Daher, who is part of this group of guys called Yes Theory. And Oh yeah, I know those guys. Yeah, so I met with him yesterday morning and he just shared our post to his Instagram story and said, hey guys, I met with Rob. He's meeting 10,000 people for an hour. I was number 1763. And I had three DMs yesterday of people reaching out to be part of my project. And at the end of the day, I had like over 200 of people reaching out from all over the world. So it's crazy to see just how one thing can swing the momentum of what you're working on. But you have to be able to just walk forward even when there's no promise of that. Oh man, those are really good words. Because I mean, I I definitely have felt that experience in my own entrepreneurial journey of being like, oh my gosh, is this going to work? Is is anybody paying attention? Is Am I going to be able to keep on doing this? Am I going to keep on doing this work that I think is important? And inevitably, and I feel like more often than not, it happens right kind of beyond that breaking point. But inevitably, some sort of opportunity pops up or some sort of, you know, piece of exposure, you know, whatever it is, something happens and, and it reminds you why you're doing what you do. And it, it gives you that, that confidence and that encouragement to keep on going. I love that you get to experience that in a project like this. That's beautiful. It's awesome. And I think there's so much learning to be done just from existing and going through that process. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I'm still in it and looking at the next four months of my life or whatever. So I'm at the age now where all of my friends are deciding to get married. So I have weddings to fly back to the East Coast for and whatnot. And I really had to take like a, a reality check and, and look at my finances a couple of weeks ago and be like, all right, how long can I actually do this thing before I have to get a part-time job or like aggressively seek funding or something like that. (laughs) And I realized if I were to make no more money through sponsorships or whatever from now until August, I'd run completely out of my life savings. And it was kind of a reality check, but it's also in my mind kind of an exciting time. And I'm still confidently approaching that and walking towards it. For me, it almost feels like this is the part where if you're going exploring with friends, there's that one cave that people are like, oh, I don't know if you should go down there. It could be dangerous. And I just feel like I'm taking the light and going to explore that cave on my own. So I can come back and tell other people, hey, you know what? It's actually not that bad. You can come down this path and here's why. Or I can go down and be like, don't ever go down this path. That was actually a huge (laughs) mistake. But it feels cool to be exploring this time of my life and the uncertainty ahead. How have you already seen this project change who you are in the last few years? I think the appreciation for my friends and family has been one of the biggest things. Uh, My perspective has grown a ton just because my idea of the path that a life could take has been broken down time and time again through the stories of people that I'm meeting. And I've also just realized one of my biggest takeaways is that no one knows what they're doing in life. And I think I say it all the time. I think a lot of us feel like we don't have our stuff together and we think everyone around us has their lives together. But in my mind, no one has their lives together. So when I feel like I don't know the answers, I feel comfortable in that space. So it's just, it's given me confidence in a weird way just by realizing that confidence is just knowing that you're in the comfort of no one else having an idea of what they're doing. What do you think that the next 
decade is going to look like for you? You know, how do you feel like this project will carry with you as, you know, your life will inevitably change over the course of, you know, upwards of a decade? In general, I just, I, I think that I'll expand to more locations, visit people in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world, and kind of understand like what it's like to live a life having grown up in Asia or Africa or Europe. Um, but aside from that, I, I don't really know. There's, and I kind of like that. I like, like I said, the uncertainty of life. So I just know that I'll be meeting people for one hour at a time, progressing towards the goal of 10,000 and hopefully taking it to different locations. Yeah. Outside of that, I'm not sure. There are some things that I think about, like maybe helping foster an environment of other people being able to go down similar paths if they want to meet 10 new people or 100 new people. And one of the things that I've thought about just to do back in Philly is maybe teaching a freshman seminar at a college where the course is just students sitting down one-on-one with each other so that they can learn from each other rather than a textbook or a PowerPoint slide. Because I think there's so much value in human connection that we're not taking advantage of. And it's like this value is just walking past you every day. And the only thing you have to do to capture that value is to open up your mouth and say hi to the person next to you. But we live in an environment where that's not the norm. So I want to start to create spaces where people can do that in comfort. Man, yeah, that's so interesting. And, you know, this is 2018, and it feels like the world is more divided than ever, and that in many ways we're kind of siloing off into, you know, just spending time with people who look like us or believe the same things as us or think the same things as us. What has this project meant to you as, you know, a white male living in America who is no doubt meeting people who, you know, and and that's coming from me, another white dude living in America. Um, You know, what does it look like to be meeting people who are, you know, completely different than you, you know, who don't look like you, who maybe, you know, you don't share the same values as, you know, what are you learning from people who are are dissimilar to you? I'm just learning that it's enjoyable when I'm sitting down with people who are different than me. I love the fact that we're, we're sitting together and we're having an hour of time that we're both enjoying just learning from each other. And it's always awesome when I'm meeting with someone who comes from a completely different background than mine because somehow we came together to be sitting at the ta- same table talking about our lives and I've never had a bad experience with someone. And I think a lot of the times when I talk with people I'm more so just interested in the facts of their lives and the experiences that they've been through as opposed to their opinions on things because I think a lot of the experiences that we've been through shape the way that we think or feel towards certain things. So if by understanding, or rather by understanding where they came from and what they've been through, that gives me context for what they believe in. And I'd rather like build those bonds of similarity and understanding first before then to be like how do you feel about this or what do you think about that and it's cool too because I I find that after I meet with someone I'm more likely to go to bat for them just because we have that connection and I think about it like if I saw them on the street and they were struggling I'm more likely to help them because I have that connection with them so I don't know I don't think it's changed like my perception on how I interact with people that are different than me I've just had great experiences with everyone. And I think it's because we're both signing up to spend a good hour together. Yeah, it's interesting that you're both opting into that experience. Therefore, you know, you're both going into it looking for something, you know, mutually beneficial or that, you know, looking for a way to bring value to somebody else. That's really interesting that that kind of changes things. Right. And it's cool to think about, what it would look like if more people were to take on this challenge. And maybe that's not 10,000, but, you know, what would it look like for me to commit to meeting 12 people this year, you know, sitting down for an hour with people who I wouldn't normally, you know, sit down with, or, you know, even just that act of intentionality, I think is creating something really, really special. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think that's 
I've had um, one of the guys that I met with, he met 100 new people in Raleigh, North Carolina. There was a girl that I met with who saw my project and is now trying to meet 100 people in Edinburgh, Scotland. There's a girl who saw my project who's meeting people in Reno, Nevada. And I think that's awesome because I think if you see other people doing something and they're getting value out of it, you kind of want to follow in that same path. So I think maybe if a friend sees their project and think that's a cool idea, they'll be inspired to meet 10 new people. And I, I honestly feel like it's it's a ripple effect of just doing it and showing other people that it's okay, having them do it, having people see them do it, and hopefully just spreading more than than people knowing simply about my project. Man, I love all of this so much. I think this is so beautiful and powerful and important. And I'm so glad that you're, you're, you're taking on this mission to meet so many people, you know, for people who are listening, who want to experience, you know, this feeling of connection with other people who want to get to know the stories of other people. Um, but you know, maybe aren't necessarily going to commit a decade of their lives to do so you know, maybe to wrap up this conversation, what is a practical, tangible piece of advice you would offer people to experience more connection in their lives? Maybe just setting a small goal for yourself and maybe just meeting like a friend of your friend, because that's still someone who's pre-vetted and you have a common ground to build off of, but will also be out there enough to get you comfortable with the idea of meeting new people. So Maybe starting from there and just through my experience, I found in having conversation, like I originally wanted to do an hour because it kind of gave us time to run out of topics to speak about and we'd have to dive below the surface. But just through going through conversations with people, you start to think about topics that you can pull from and that makes you more comfortable in conversation with random people. So even with my project or if I'm out at a bar or whatever now, I know I can hold a conversation with anyone because I can pull and let's like, let's talk about music. Let's talk about your family. Let's talk about your childhood or whatever. So maybe doing that and starting with friends of your friends. So you're comfortable and then seeing where that takes you. I'm so inspired by Rob's story and everything that he's doing. His journey is a reminder that we as a society need to feel comfortable in beginning to speak to each other without agendas. Rob gives me so much hope that it could eventually become trendy or just part of the culture to expand our comfort zones by sitting down with new people. By seeing Rob take this leap and find value in his intentional connections, I hope that we all feel confidence and permission to do so on our own as well. If you aren't already following Rob, do yourself a favor and follow him on Instagram. The stories he share are incredible. And I would say go a step further than that and send him a DM. Tell him that you want to meet up. He's got a decade of this ahead of him. He's probably going to come to your city. It would be amazing for you to get to be a part of his 10,000 people he meets. If you're new to Sounds Good, we would love for you to stick around. If you liked this conversation, you'd also love my conversation with Taylor Tippett, a flight attendant who meets new people all day, every day. And my conversation with Frank Warren, who has listened to the secrets of thousands of strangers with his project, Post Secret. You can find both of these episodes and more than 100 other episodes by searching for Sounds Good wherever you listen to podcasts. This podcast was created by me, Brandon Harvey, as a part of Good, Good, Good. Good, Good, Good is a community that believes in the power of celebrating good news and becoming good news. Chad Michaels Snavely and the team at CM Studio edit and mix the show, and Christy Karenbrock offers production support. And you can learn more about what we do at Good, Good, Good by visiting goodgoodgood.co. And in case you missed it, we've released the newest episode of The Good Newspaper. And here's a confession, issue four might just be my favorite yet. The inspiring pieces in this issue include a feature story on the secret underground railroad that's helping North Korean refugees escape inhumane conditions, articles about antidepressants, suicide rates dropping in Japan, and self-care. It also provides action steps on how to support restorative justice. Join the Good Newspaper family and subscribe today and get a full year of good news delivered straight to your door. 
You can do that by visiting shop.goodgoodgood.co or by clicking on the link in the show notes. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Maybe the most important thing you could do after listening to this episode is tap into the value of human connection and strike up a meaningful conversation with the next person that passes you by. Sound good? 